Today's reading is from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentary on the Bible and Bhagavad Gita. This week's reading is The Secret of Right Action. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. One of the most famous stories in the Gospels is that of Martha and Mary. Jesus, visiting the home of Martha, was teaching while her sister Mary sat at his feet, absorbing his divine love and wisdom. Martha, meanwhile, busied herself with serving her guests and was upset with Mary for not helping her. Lord, she cried, doesn't it matter to you that my sister has left me to do all this serving alone? Please, Ask her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered. Thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. This story is classic, for Martha's complaint is very understandable and not, on the surface of it, spiritually wrong. Jesus may well have told Mary to get up and help her. We don't really know that he didn't, consider it as he always was of others' needs. But the teaching here doesn't concern the obvious dilemma of devotees to work for God or to spend one, all one's time in prayer. It concerns rather the attitude of mind. Jesus didn't tell Martha, Martha, you are doing too much. He told her, rather, you're letting your work affect your inner peace. That was the contrast. Not work versus contemplation, but restless preoccupation versus peaceful absorption under all circumstances. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, the second chapter, actions performed under the influence of desire are greatly inferior to those which are guided by wisdom. Happiness eludes people when they act from self-interest. Seek shelter, therefore, in the equanimity of wisdom. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh, 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 oh. Good morning to all and a happy Mother's Day. I'll come back to that. Our affirmation is on service and it brings to my mind two things. One is last weekend Padma and I gave the Sunday service, actually two of them in a row, one after the other at the Center for Spiritual Living on Sandpoint Way. So we weren't here last weekend, but um, it was a wonderful experience. We had Bhima and Bhakti in Sydney there uh, doing some chants at the invitation of one of our community residents who has worked there for 20 years as the keyboardist and pianist for their, what they call their band, Jaw Feldman. So we got to play some chants there and, uh, and uh, they did their rock music and we did our chants and uh, a good time was had by all. So, you know, Ernest Holm, the founder of uh, Science of Mind, lived in Los Angeles during the years that Yogananda did as well. So um, no one seems to have a record of their having met, but as their uh, minister um, pointed out in an <clears throat> introduction that uh, Ernest Holm drew some of his teachings from Yogananda's teachings. So uh, there has always been a connection between our works and that of unity. We've had uh, Swami Kriyananda was often a speaker throughout the country at such places and, and our singers and so forth. So um, it was a little bit like being home. Most of the folks raised their hands when asked if they'd been to East West Bookshop <coughs> and half again as many and having read the autobiography. So it was, um, it was uh, fun for Padma and I to go out in places like that to serve. 
Now yesterday, a beautiful day, I hope you all had a chance to enjoy it, but there were about 20 of us here uh, helping to prepare the grounds for this afternoon's wedding and next weekend's uh, dedication of the yoga hall there. And uh, it, uh, it was fun to watch uh, the artists in residence creating the flowers and different ones washing windows. And it was really quite a pleasant time. Earlier in the week, we had two rascals, um, uh, Matt over there, who's, who's hiding behind closed eyes. And uh, I don't see Jim Kent here yet today, but uh, believe it or not, Jim Kent climbed up the dome to wash uh, the cupola. Uh, with, with uh, Matt's encouragement. <laughs> anyway, there's lots of loving hands um, uh, have come forward in the last many months to um, really dynamically and creatively make the grounds here in the buildings um, something that they clearly love and cherish. So I think Divine Mother's very pleased. Remind me to get back to Forrest Gump um, a little bit later. I mentioned when, last week at uh, Center for Spiritual Living, they, had, they were very familiar with Forrest Gump there, so I'm hoping you are here too. Um, but Divine Mother's Day, what are we talking about? Well, you know, Swami Kriyananda, when he, uh, he, he left us three years ago, left this earth, and one of the things on his bucket list, in fact probably the only one that I've ever heard of, was he was uh, sincerely wanting to fin uh, visit Mexico again and go to the great cathedral where um, the tilma of Juan, is it Juan Diego? Um, you know, the famous Guadal uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. So after his passing, some of his close uh, staff members and others went there on his behalf. But he had been making a point to go to the different places where the, in the last century or so, Divine Mother is said to have appeared. Medjugorje, for example, Fatima, Lourdes, and, and of course throughout India as well. It's, it's very much a time for Divine Mother to appear on earth. It's no coincidence that in the last century, during a time when materialism was at its height, whether expressed through atheistical communism or through just the materialistic consciousness of capitalism in the 20th century, during which maybe 100 million people were slaughtered, where, where as Yogananda put it, uh, Stalin made Hitler look like a Boy Scout relative to the number of people he slaughtered. And, and that rising influence of meaninglessness in that century um, was an occasion for God in the form of Mother to come and offer our hearts the reassurance that we need. Yogananda came from coming from India, of course. Um, there are more divine mothers in India than you can, you know, shake an incense stick at. There's just a, I don't know if it's a hundred and eight or a thousand and eight or a million and eight, but there's a heap of divine mothers over there. And he being Bengali was raised in the worship of divine mother in the form of Kali. Well, have you ever seen a picture of Kali with her red tongue hanging out and a garland of skulls around her neck? It doesn't, you know, it's not all that warm and cuddly. Um, because divine mother is this creation. Divine Mother, whether she is in her creative mode or in sustaining or destructive mode, it is all God in the form of Mother Nature. We ourselves even say Mother Nature. Uh, many of us may not know that the um, adoration of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of Jesus, began at, in the early centuries of Christianity, though it became codified and so forth only in recent centuries, perhaps, and, uh, and no coincident in response to reaction to the sort of somewhat sterility and masculine energy of the Protestant so-called Reformation, quote, unquote. And so, um, you know, this, this tendency in our, in our hearts to revere the divine in the form of mother is deeply embedded in us. As Yogananda put it, the mother is closer to her children than the father. 
Now you may be wondering where Forrest Gump fits into this. And I think of um, two movies come to mind, which is The Rainmaker with Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise, in which the autistic younger son brought out the heart qualities of the very materialistic and, and uh, hard-edged older brother. And, and he had a secret, didn't he? A secret pain that was revealed in the movie. Well, Forrest Gump, one of my great philosophers of the 20th century, was the one who codified the precept that life is like a box of chocolates and you never know what you're going to get. And uh, I've used that many times in wondering what I got, <laughs> not wanting to chew it, <laughs> as it were. And of course, the other thing he said is, uh, stupid is as stupid does. And, uh, and that's deeper than you think. <laughs> You'd have to be pretty stupid not to know that. <laughs> because one of the great precepts of spirituality in our lifetimes is our spirituality is not judged by our beliefs, but by how we behave. Well, I heard it did tell that uh, Forrest Gump went off to heaven, and uh, he was there at the pearly gates. And St. Peter, as his was, you know, announced him, for us that uh, there was now an entrance exam to the pearly gates to heaven and there's three questions he had to answer you see and uh, one of them was he said Forrest what two days of the week begin with the letter T well Forrest had to think about that a bit so he could say I mean, he said, oh he said well that would be tomorrow and today <laughs> St. Peter said, that's not the right answer, but I, I have to give you credit for that. <laughs> and so then he said, well, Forrest, how many seconds are there in a year? Whew, that's a tough one for Forrest, who hardly went to school. So he thought, and he thought, and he thought, well, I think there's 12. And St. Peter said, Forrest, how did you ever come with 12 seconds in a year? Well, he said, there's January 2nd, there's February 2nd. <laughs> So St. Peter said, well, that wasn't the right answer, but I, I have to give you credit. He <laughs> said, so there's one more question, Forrest. He said, um, do you happen to know the first name of God? His first name? Forrest said, well, that's actually the easiest one you've asked. He says, because I grew up with a Protestant hymn, and it's very clear that uh, Andy talked with me, Andy walked with me, <laughs> and he told me I am his own. Our world is a troubled place, <laughs> and it desperately needs some humor. But in, you know, I, I grew up with uh, the devotion to Mary, and uh, was an altar boy, as some of you are probably tired of hearing. Um, but we went during the month of May, and I think October were two months of the year where we had what we called novenas, and you'd go to a church on a, one of the weeknights and do the rosary and so forth and, and people were very dedicated to that and I have come to realize being on this path and, and with Divine Mother now we've put the picture of Yogananda's mother um, Swami Kriyananda was once asked well how can we who are followers of this path of Kriya and Yogananda etc etc and he speaks so often about Divine Mother and as I said earlier, we're, we're not inclined probably to um, worship Kali as a form of Divine Mother for obvious reasons. But Swami Kriyananda thought for a moment, he said, well, because Yogananda identified somewhat subtly, but, but not that subtly, that his own mother was an incarnation of Divine Mother in that beautiful poem, My Mother, that he gave, he said, for those of you who feel to... Um, have a representation of Divine Mother in, in a more human way. He said, why don't you put um, Yogananda's mother on the altar? I mentioned to you a few weeks ago when our friend Tushti died that I praying for her, I couldn't, I couldn't get past the fact that I had no way to relate to her soul except by her earth name, Tushti, and by visualizing her earthly form as I knew her. 
because um, you know, well, Divine Mother, how do we how do we relate? Well, certainly many of us divide, relate to Divine Mother in the form of nature, of course. But too many of us are, are also, we worship nature almost for its own, own sake. We're so attached to the beauties of nature that I think too often even our devotees forget to see Divine Mother behind nature. You can hug a tree, but it's not going to hug you back. And so, you know, to take it to a, a form we can relate to, uh, it's an interesting suggestion, and I, I recommend it uh, to those who feel inclined. But we need, you know, when we think of Divine Mother and we think of what's happening on our, especially our country and countries like ours, which is, of course, the, the women's movement, and it is divinely inspired, even though not all aspects of it are exactly divine, but nonetheless, it is necessary for this planet. And bringing in the uh, worship of God in the feminine form is, uh, is the highest ideal of that. But I was thinking the other day that you can look at all of the conflicts on our earth and, and in conflicts you might have with another person or uh, whether it's political and we don't want to talk politics here today. It's a nice day, you know. Um, but really, I, I began to think about all the conflicts I could imagine, whether personal or global. And you could view them through the lens of the imbalance between masculine energies and feminine energies. Now, mind you, I'm not saying men and women. That's, uh, in fact, the entire transgender movement has for its affirmation from a spiritual standpoint, if nothing else, um, the affirmation that our biology does not determine our consciousness. And if that isn't a Vedantic affirmation, I don't know what is. And there's a strong movement today towards equality because there needs to be equality. Instead of resorting to force, we need more cooperation. Instead of um, reverting to um, runaway consumerism and consumption, we need conservation of resources, our own energies, and so forth. Instead of the emphasis merely on justice, we need mercy as well, like the, like the guy who was hauled before the judge, and he's clearly guilty, and the judge asks him, how do you plead? And he says, I'll plead for mercy. <laughs> this is what we need more on this, on this planet. Every aspect of what we face on the world today could be viewed through a more benign lens of inclusivity, compassion, understanding, dialogue. On the other hand, I, I think back in the, when 9-11, when Swami Kriyananda was asked, uh, who should we, what should we pray for? One of the things he commented, as sort of an aside, it was by no means the main thrust of his response, but he, people were saying, well, we should pray for the terrorists and all that. And, well, fine, if you want to, but you know, let's pray for those who are open to prayer and who can benefit more directly. After all, we only have so much time and energy that's focused where it can be. And I think of the Mahabharata in India, the great battle. And so the good guys, the Pandavas, they had been exiled by the bad guys for umpteen years. And they come back and they said, listen, even though there were the rightful heirs of the kingdom, we only, you know, just give us a little village over here. Well. Their cousins, their enemies, self-appointed enemies, uh, who had absconded with the kingdom, wouldn't even give them a village. And this is often how it is in that respect. It's a change of consciousness. When there is a battle, when there is a disagreement, when you dislike somebody, and you come up with every reason to dislike them, anything from their hair to their shoes to every word that comes out of their mouth, you see? You don't give them an inch. You don't give them a village because you don't like them. And so what we need is that opening of understanding, which is of the heart. It's not an intellectual thing. We participated in interfaith uh, activities over the years, been invited to, and I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, it's just that when you create an interfaith service, and this faith does that, and that faith does that, and this one does that, that it, it's sort of like, like going to a smorgasbord, remember smorgasbords, anybody? Okay, 
Well, you're all too young. Anyway, you go through a smorgasbord, and by the end of the end of your meal, you got an upset stomach. It, you get indigestion by trying to mix too many things together. And so it's a good start to respect and so forth. But the deeper, the deeper aspect comes in our consciousness. When we want to think, oh yeah, I'm supposed to like people of a different race. I mean, you have to think that way. It should be something that's automatic. And it's no coincidence then that this energy of rising equality with, I mean, didn't we see the suffragette movie or that some, I couldn't believe it. You know, I think back and uh, this was the suffragettes about what, a hundred years ago or something and having to fight for a right to vote. I mean, how stupid, but that's where our consciousness was and many, many other things like that. But it's changing rapidly, but it changes from within. And so we need that balance. And it's not about, it's really not about men and women, okay? The more you focus on the differences, it's just endless. But what I observed, what I, came to me the other day, it's pretty obvious, but it, it, I, thought, I thought it was interesting. I said that the more we treat each other, speak, we're speaking now of gender, but in anything, it can be race, it can be, in fact, it should be everything, religion, etc. The more we see equality in one another, the more that leads to transcendence of those qualities. It's when you emphasize the differences that you're stuck. You can't get out of the box. And so this whole movement towards equality has, from the spiritual standpoint, the purpose of transcending the consciousness that surrounds those differences, which ultimately separate people, whether of race or religion or nationality or gender or any of these other things. And transcendence is the hallmark goal of yoga, of meditation, expressed by Vedanta, expressed by Jesus Christ, expressed by great ones of all religions. Transcendence of the dualities is in fact our purpose. And, and so when we celebrate Mother's Day today, it's celebrating the rise of an influence that is necessary to balance the imbalance that threatens our planet and threatens so many. Uh, I mean, think of mass killings. I mean, there isn't anything that you cannot understand from this particular imbalance. It's a great blessing. and I. I hope to see, I'd like to see, in, in, even in our own work. When I think back to those evenings in prayer, doing the rosary as a, as a kid and so forth, those were special sacred moments. And uh, I don't think it's any coincidence that um, our teacher, Swami Kriyananda, I don't, did I say this already when he, maybe I didn't, I was talking to um, where, where Veronica before, and she's from Mexico. Um, that he wanted to go to the last visit to, um, to Mexico City to see the, the, til the, uh, the tilpa. Anyway, the, you know, the beautiful picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so I, I think, you know, I find in that at least a message. And I, I think over time I'd like to see our work to be more conscious of that form of worship and that form of, of, of meditation. Uh, on different aspects of the mother, having perhaps some special, maybe next year for Mother's Day, we can have something a little bit more focused, uh, our kirtan, Divine Mother Kirtan, something like that. I, I think we need to emphasize that. It's been given to us in our work, but we don't do a lot with it. And I think we should try to do more with it. Happy Mother's Day. I'd like to read to you from Whispers from Eternity, the selection Riemann made. In the temple of united hearts, it befits not thy lily tender feet to dance on the stony soil of hard hearts, on the petals of my sympathy for many, for others, may thy tenderness dance forever. Divine Mother, May I feel thy heart throbs in my own heart. In thy joy, 
my happiness, thy wise direction in all my activity, thy spirit in my soul. And then I'll advance forward to the end. O Divine Mother, unite our hearts as one heart, so that on the sacred altar of united hearts, we may find thine omnipresence enthroned forever. Om Shanti. Amen. I'd like to give you an opportunity now to make an offer.